Let's just open in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gathering together this morning that we're gathered together in your name. We know, Lord, that you are in our midst. Father. And as I bring this message, Lord, I just pray, Lord, there'll be none of me, be all of you. This is your message, Lord. I'm just the, the one who's speaking it, Father. Because of that, Lord, I just pray that you'll prepare every heart here this morning to hear what you have to say by your Holy Spirit. For each one of us, Lord, we're all in different places and we understand that, Lord. But by your Holy Spirit, the comforter, the counsellor, the one who leads us into all truth, Lord, may you witness to our hearts this day. And I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. This may seem a strange way to start a message, but I want to tell you a little bit about myself. It'll only take a moment or two, and I tell it because it's so easy for us to misunderstand and hold pictures of things that really aren't as we think they might be. And uh, I have a condition called synesthesia. Has anybody heard of it? No. It comes from the Greek words syn, and that's S-Y-N. <laughs> Meaning union. And asthesius, which means sensation. And it's described as a mixing or a union of the senses. Now let me explain very quickly. It's a very rare condition. I think it's less than about 0.1% of the population that have it or are believed to have it because it's hard to nail down. And more than 70% of those who do have it are women. So that might explain some rather unusual things about me. I don't know. But um, in my case, what it causes me to see is I see all of the letters, numbers and words as having a specific colour. And that sound, I know that sounds strange, but um, it's the most common form of this condition and people who, who have that form of it always see things, letters, numbers and words in different colours, but they're specific colours to themselves. They never change for each person. For argument's sake, I, I see the, the word July as reddish-brown. I see the word Saturday as black. I see the number five as pink. Someone else with the same condition would see it different colours. And the other thing is that I see things in specific spatial arrangement. And I think of my extended family. Every time I see their faces, but there's my daughter, my son, young Michael. There's Debbie's family up here. Brothers and sisters cousins over here, nephews, and they're always in the same place. I know that sounds really strange. And also I see the years of my life, starting in 1951, down here. But as I look at those years and they sort of come along, they follow this path that's always the same, up into the 60s, into the 70s, 80s starts to come across to the 90s, the 90s wobbles a bit, you get to the 2000s and it comes along and up here in 2022. Now that's how I see things. And I also see intangible thoughts and ideas in spatial arrangements. And they never change. Now just hang on to those thoughts for a moment. Because I do have a reason for telling you that. And turn with me to Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14. Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14. Verse 13, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Verse 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. When you consider those verses, does it conjure up a picture in your mind? What sort of picture does it bring to you? And talking with Debbie, when she was a young girl in Colorado growing up, she loved to hike along the Rocky Mountain trails with her dog called Charlie. Charlie struggled a bit because he was a basset hound and he was a bit low to the ground. But <laughs> Debbie always wanted to see what was up the next hill, what was around the next corner. And I asked the question, do you imagine paths like that? Paths of mystery and, and everything else. 
Perhaps you think of paths like the path that Christian walked in Pilgrim's Progress and how he described those paths so very well. Is that what comes to mind for you? With my tendency to see things spatially, when I first read those verses about the straight gate and the narrow way, this picture came to me and it stayed with me. It's still there with me today. And basically, I see the narrow way along here. I see a big fence here. At the end of the narrow way, I see the straight gate. Everything above that is the broad way and there's a massive big broad gate up here. And that's a, that's a simple picture. And it came to mind, as I said, when I read those verses a long time ago, but it stayed with me. So I read those verses, when I think of the straight way, the narrow way, the broad gate, the, the wide gate, that's that picture that comes to mind. But over the past several weeks, I've been meditating on the, the Christian walk in the early church and our place in the body of Christ, and particularly as I've been preparing this message, that picture has sort of become a catalyst for what I want to share this morning about how we ought to be living our lives in these last days. Before we go any further, let's ask ourselves a question. Who was Jesus addressing here in these two verses we've just read when he spoke of the straight gate and the broad gate, the narrow way and the broad way? Who was he speaking to in Matthew 7, 13 and 14? And as we know, Matthew chapters 5 through 7 have, become, have come to be known as the Sermon on the Mount. We, we all know that. But as we read any or all of that discourse that goes with those three chapters, we need to know who is Jesus speaking to. We need to understand that, be sure to understand that. And we can find that out by reading Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. So if you turn there, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Verse 1, and seeing the multitudes, seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Verse 2, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Now the word disciples here refers to his followers, those who want to learn, scholars, those who want to be taught by him. And initially they were probably scattered throughout all the multitudes. But when he began to teach, they would have made every effort to gather closely around him because they wanted to hear what he was teaching and what he was saying to them. But while he's teaching his disciples, he's being heard by the multitudes as well. And that's really important because for those in the world, the multitudes, there's a very practical application of these verses in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. And it comes down to two simple choices. Take the wide gate and the broad way which leads to destruction, and that is eternity without him in hell. Or take the narrow gate and the difficult way which leads to life. That's eternity with him in heaven. That's the practical application facing those in the world. And it's difficult to misunderstand, but each one of these separate paths will lead. Christless eternity in hell, with Christ for eternity in heaven. We read in Proverbs 16.25, There is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. But as for his disciples, his followers, and for us here today, there's a deeper understanding of these verses. Because Jesus is both the gate, in John 10.9, I am the door, and if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. And he is the way. John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And he is saying to follow him. And that to follow him requires faith, discipline and endurance. And even though it's a difficult life, it is the only life worth living. Such a life there's fruit worthy of repentance, Matthew 3.8. It reaches the lost, it glorifies his name and it results in everlasting rewards in heaven. And that's the place where I'm coming to you this morning. 
I'm not talking about the world any longer. I've spoken about the world in relation to these verses. I spoke about it briefly, I know, but that's it. From here on, I'm talking about us. Everybody's here this morning, and everybody who's watching online, and about everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus. As Christians, having made the commitment to follow him by entering through the straight gate and walking that narrow path, we come into a much deeper understanding of his will and purpose for our lives and of our place within the body of Christ. Because these verses are no longer a discussion of us losing our souls, as it is for those in the world, but rather it's moved to a much deeper level and become instead a discussion of the failure of us as Christians to live out God's will and purpose for our lives here in this world before he comes or calls us home. Jesus has commanded us to avoid the broad gate and the broad way and to enter into the straight gate and to follow the narrow way. And many followers do indeed enter in at the straight gate, but then fail to steadfastly follow the narrow way set before them. It's too hard. Instead, they prefer the easy and the broad way. And as a result, there will be few works, if any, in their lives which would clearly show their faith in Jesus Christ. May we guard our hearts with all diligence that we don't also stumble and be found amongst such as them. Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. But before we move on, let's look a little closer at the word straight. And I'm sure you all realise that the word, it is the word straight spelt S-T-R-A-I-T. It can be used as an adjective, a noun or a transitive verb which, as David will tell you, a transitive verb is a verb which requires an object. But I just want to look at some definitions of the word straight as an adjective. And I've taken these from the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, and you know I like to do that because Noah Webster often refers to scripture in his definitions of words. So straight as an adjective. One, narrow, close. It's not broad. As in, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it, Matthew 7.13. We've just read that. Two, close, intimate, as a straight degree of favour. Three, strict, rigorous. Four, difficult, distressful. Now, let me ask an interesting question here. Is the straight gate of which Jesus is speaking is it at the beginning of our Christian walk or is it at the end? Before we became Christians, we were in the world and obviously walking on that broad way, that broad path. Then when we were saved, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, Ephesians 2.8, we entered in at the straight gate onto that narrow path. But if we don't stay on that narrow path, and wander off instead and follow the broad and easy way in our lives, we'll miss the straight gate when we come to the end of our life here on earth. And then we'll have no choice but to enter instead through the broad gate with the many. So to answer that question, is the straight gate at the beginning of our Christian walk or at the end? We can see that it is at both. The straight gate bookends, if you like, our walk through this world along the narrow way. Understandingly then, if we enter through the straight gate at the beginning of our walk but miss it at the end, that will be our own doing. We will have wandered. Or perhaps I should be, it will be our own undoing. Because although the broad way won't lead us as Christians to a crisis eternity as it does for the world, it's not the path the Lord will have us to take. It is not led of the spirit. It's not an obedient life. It doesn't bear fruit. It doesn't meet the needs of others. It doesn't reach the lost. It doesn't glorify his name and it impacts our rewards in heaven. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 10 through 15. First Corinthians chapter 3 verses 10 through 15. Paul is speaking here to his brothers, to the brethren. Verse 10. 
According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the, fa I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, a stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be born, burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Our works are going to be tested. Make no mistake about that. He calls us to enter in at the straight gate through him and to walk in the narrow way with him and never to wander from him. And when we see professing Christians unwittingly, lazily or even intentionally wandering over onto the wide path, joining and being joined by multitudes of other like-minded Christians along the way, make no mistake, they are being disobedient to God's will and purpose for their lives, being content with their own salvation. And you may say, well, so what? They're saved. Don't worry about them, they're okay. And in fact, that's what many of them say themselves, about themselves. Don't worry about me, I'm okay. Who's heard that from family and friends? Don't worry about me, I'm okay. Well, perhaps I are or perhaps I aren't. More on that later. But that's not the point that I want to make here. And to help me make that point, I have a question for you. Does anybody know what happened on Tuesday, the 3rd of February, 1959? I know you young people won't know. Some older people might know. Nobody? Okay. There was a plane crash near Clear Lake, Iowa, in the United States. And three men were killed in that plane crash. Anybody know who they were? Richie Valens, J. P. Richardson, a.k.a. the Big Bopper, and Buddy Holly. And the question's often asked by music lovers everywhere, and I'm sure all you guys that are in the music team have asked this question themselves. How many songs were never written because these three men died that night at the height of their music career? How many songs were never written because they died? Who can tell? So what's my point here? It's simply this. When, as professing Christians, we find ourselves blissfully meandering along the broad way, content in our own salvation with seldom a thought for the needs of others, seeking our own comfort and pleasures instead, how many lost souls never get to hear the good news of the gospel? How many, rep how many prayers remain unspoken? How many broken lives remain untouched? How many truths remain untold? How many lies go unchallenged? How many basic needs go unmet? Doesn't that smack of having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof? 2 Timothy 3.5 Isn't it a selfish salvation? Is it not the faith without works that James speaks of in James chapter 2, verses 17 and 26? Let's take a look at that for a moment, faith without works. Turn with me to James chapter 2. We're going to read from verse 14 to 26. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, sorry, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, 
and one of you say to them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful for the body. What does it profit? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled with saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Verse 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith alone. Likewise also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now the first thing we must understand here is that we are not saved by faith plus works. We're not saved by faith plus works. James is not saying that trusting in the Lord as our saviour is not enough and that we must add our deeds of charity and, and devotion to his redemptive work on the cross. No, no, no. Before I go on, does anybody misunderstand that? Good. Such a thing as heresy. And you know, it was John Wesley's error before he came to the understanding that we are not saved by our works but that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And when he, John Wesley, came to that understanding, his works became the outward proof of the reality of his faith, the outward expression of what would otherwise have been invisible. Now, in all the different translations of the Bible I looked at over this past week, this section in James 2, 14 to 16 is titled, Faith Without Works is Dead. And we know that section titles are added by various publishers as a guide. They are not the inspired word of God. And we need to be careful never to place too much confidence in them. They may or may, may not be indicative of what's to come. But then again, they may not even be in the right place. The divisions might not be right. They might be out by a couple of verses here or there. So we don't place a lot of confidence in them. So what I want... Now, let's consider James 2, 14 to 16, instead of as faith without works is dead. To make it easier to understand, let's consider it on the basis of justification by works. And to understand that, we need to understand six aspects of justification. And as I read these scriptures, I'm going to include some comments from the uh, Believer's Bible Commentary because it does bring a lot of clarity to what is happening here. First aspect, number one, we are justified by grace, Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And this simply means, means that we don't deserve to be justified. In fact, we deserve the very opposite. Number two, we are justified by faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that comes from Romans chapter 5, verse 1. And basically, faith is a human response to God's grace. By faith, we accept the free gift. And faith is that which appropriates what God has for us. Number three, we are justified by blood. Romans 5, 9. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And here we see that blood is the price which had to be paid in order to procure our justification. The debt of sin was met by the precious blood of Christ. Now God can justify ungodly sinners because a righteous satisfaction has been made. We're justified by God, 
Romans 8.33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. And the truth here is that God is the person who justifies. We are justified by power. Romans 4.25. Jesus, who was delivered for our offences and was raised up again for our justification. Our justification here is linked to the power that raised Christ from the dead. And his resurrection proves that God is satisfied. Number six, we are justified by works. James 2.24. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith alone. Works are the outward proof of the reality of our faith. They give outward expression to what would otherwise be invisible. And so from this we see that we're justified by grace, by faith, by blood, by God, by power and by works. And there's no contradiction between all of these statements because they simply present the various aspects of the same truth. Grace is the principle upon which God justifies. Faith is the means by which man receives it. Blood is the price which the Saviour had to pay. God is the active agent in justification. Power is the proof and works are the result. Now, note very carefully that in verse 14, where we started to read from James chapter 2, James does not say, what does it profit though a man has faith? What he does say is, what does it profit if a man says he has faith? Now, it's not a question of a man who truly has faith and yet isn't saved but rather a man who has nothing but a profession of faith. He says he has faith, but there's nothing about his life that indicates that he does. Can that kind of faith save him? And I'm going to leave the rest of that James chapter 2 for another day, because I want to start to bring this to a close this morning. But I encourage you to take the time to study James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26 for yourselves so that you clearly understand what James is meaning here when he says faith without works is dead. What I want to look at now is what kind of faith do we display if as Christians I add that again what kind of faith do we display if we as Christians are not steadfast in following the narrow path and wander instead onto the broad way? And that's a searching question, isn't it? Let's go back for a moment to the straight gate and narrow way we spoke of earlier and that picture that I explained to you that formed in my mind so long ago. And I shared it with you. We see that it is woefully inadequate. But I shared it so that I could expose it now and instead paint a true picture of how we are to walk in these last days. Now, many of you know my testimony how I heard and understood the gospel for the first time at Festival Hall in Melbourne in 1990. I was at one of the lowest points in my life and I went forward with maybe a hundred other people that morning, Sunday morning, and gave my heart to the Lord. And I'm as certain as I can be there's none of you here today or watching online who are amongst those 100 others at Festival Hall on that morning who accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. Where are they now? I have no idea. But let me ask you this. What's the testimony of your salvation? Where did it happen? When did it happen? Why did it happen? How old were you? Were you alone? Were you with others? What were the circumstances of your life at that time? Can you even remember? Were you broken, destitute, hurting, searching, without hope, perhaps even suicidal? Were you caught up in gambling, adultery, thieving, lying, fornication, pornography, violence? Or were you just plain tired of living a desperate and meaningless life in this world? And yet, here we all are this morning. Why? Because somebody reached out to us. 
Somebody prayed for us. Someone listened to us. Someone took us under their wing. Someone met our needs. Someone loved us. Someone cared for us. Someone shed tears for us. Someone shared the good news of the gospel with us. And it was all done by someone in the name of Jesus because that was their reasonable service to him. And we had an encounter with the Lord through one of his faithful servants who steadfastly followed that narrow path. Not for their own sakes, but in obedience to him and for his name's sake, because he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3.9 And that encounter with him was not by accident. And it wasn't by chance. And as a result, we were saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And then we entered in at that straight gate and were set upon that narrow way. So here we are, a small group of believers that have come from near and far, literally. And the places where each of us entered in at that straight gate are scattered all over the world. But we all entered in through Jesus Christ. And the narrow paths that we walk are all personal. But he walks with each one of us. Our paths are many and varied, but he is the solid foundation, the rock. And we go through deep valleys and dark places. But he never leaves us, nor does he forsake us. And who can tell the time and place when he will call us home to glory? But clearly we see the woeful inadequacy of that picture of the straight gate and the narrow way, which I shared with you at the beginning of the message. We can understand now that the entry to the straight gate is not a place that you can search for on your GPS or on Google. You won't find it on a map. It's not a place you have to travel for hundreds of miles to reach. No, it's our saviour, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he meets you wherever you are. All you have to do is call upon his name. We understand now that the path we travel it's not like a freeway that leads from point A to point B and it's the same scenery and experience for everybody. No. It's our personal walk through this world with our Saviour at our side. It's different in substance and duration for everyone. But it's the same foundation. Hebrews 13.8 Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. You know, that inadequate picture that I spoke of earlier, narrow way, straight gate, broad way, broad gate, that's so far from what we have here before us. The paths that we walk, the narrow ways that we walk, when you think about it, you know, there's just a, a group of us here, but there's another church down the road and around the corner. There's another one over towards Carondale. There's no one on the other side of Brisbane. They're all over Brisbane. Little churches, people, gatherings of people just like us. And they all walk in that path. They entered in at the straight gate through Jesus. They walk with him and he will lead them home through that straight gate. And you think about that, those paths just don't go along here with the separation from the broad way. No, they crisscross that broad way, all over the world, everywhere. Those paths, our paths, the paths of other believers who follow that narrow way, crisscross the world and all the broad ways. And that's where we need to be in true faith. And out of that true faith comes works that meet the needs of the lost, the people, the hurting. You understand that? It's a massive picture. Keep that in mind. We spoke a couple of minutes ago about the reasonable service of someone whom the Lord used to reach out to us, to each one of us, with the good news of the gospel. There may have been several someones. I don't know who was praying for me. No idea. Maybe you don't either. Maybe there were several. I have no idea. 
but there was someone. We don't know who they were, perhaps. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. But what if they hadn't bothered to carry out their reasonable service to the Lord? What then of us? We could speculate on that, but there's no really good point to do that. I'd rather ask a question of all of us here, watching online, myself included. Do we understand our reasonable service and all that stems from that? Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I want to quote to you on these two verses, again from the Bible Believer's Commentary. I just like the way it, it brings out a lot of, well, brings a lot of clarity to this. And in these two verses, of course, course, Paul's talking about our duties towards other believers. Now, about verse 1, and I quote, Serious and devout considerations of the mercies of God, as they have been set forth in chapters 1 to 11 of Romans, leads to only one conclusion. We should present our bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. Our bodies stand for all our members, and by extension, our entire lives. Total commitment is our reasonable service. It is our reasonable service in this sense. If the Son of God died for me, then the least I can do is live for him. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, says the great British athlete C.T. Studd, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Isaac Watts' great hymn says the same thing. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my heart, my life, my all. Reasonable service may also be translated spiritual worship. As believer priests, we do not come to God with the bodies of slain animals, but with the spiritual sacrifice of yielded lives. We also offer to him our service, Romans 15, 16, our praise, Hebrews 13, 15, and our possessions, Hebrews 13, 16. And going on to the second verse, Paul urges us not to be conformed to this world. Or as Phillips paraphrases it, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mould. Don't we see that happening today? Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mould. When we come to the kingdom of God, we should abandon the thought patterns and the lifestyles of this world. The word, literally A-J-G-E, as used here, means the society or system that man has built in order to make himself happy without God. The society or system that man has built in order to make himself happy without God. It's a kingdom that is antagonistic to God. The God and prince of this world is Satan. And we read of that in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, John 12.31, John 14.30, John 16.11. All unconverted people are his subjects. He seeks to attract and hold people through the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. 1 John 2.16 The world has its own politics, its own art, its own music, its own religion, its own amusement, its own thought patterns and lifestyles. And it seeks to get everyone to conform to its culture and customs. It hates nonconformists like Christ and his followers. Christ died to deliver us from this world. 
This world is crucified to us and we are crucified to the world. It would be absolute disloyalty to the Lord for believers to love the world or any part of the world. Anyone who loves the world is an enemy of God. Believers are not of the world any more than Christ is of the world. However, they are sent into the world to testify that its works are evil, evil and that salvation is available to all who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Believers are not of the world any more than Christ is of the world. However, they are sent into the world to testify that its works are evil and that salvation is available to all who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We should not only be separated from the world, we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds, which means that we should think the way God thinks as revealed in the Bible. Then we can experience the direct guidance of God in our lives and we will find that instead of being distasteful and hard, his will is good and acceptable and perfect. Here then are three keys for knowing God's will. The first is a yielded body, the second is a separated life, and the third is a transformed mind. End quote. And as I close, let me pose three questions for all of us. Have we entered into the straight gate and are we following, walking steadfastly along that narrow way? Are our works the outward proof of the reality of our true faith? Have we presented our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service? And as C.T. Stubby mentioned him earlier, as he says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, for each one of us, and starting with me, Lord, let us examine our hearts. As your word says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Father, we want to walk on that narrow path. Lord, we don't want to be distracted. We don't want to wander across through laziness or, or whatever onto that wide path. Lord, we want to serve you. Lord, we don't want to see anybody lost. Lord, that's your desire that none should be lost. Father, we want to follow you. We want to be witnesses of you. Lord, and may we, in all that we do, in all that we think, in all that we say, Lord, be that witness of Jesus Christ, in him and through him. Of ourselves we're powerless, Lord, but in Christ, through him, we can do all things. Led by your Holy Spirit, comforted, counselled, and led into all truth. Father, we desire to walk with you. We want to know your ways, your thoughts. We want to see your will and purpose done in our lives. So, Father, help us to examine our hearts. And may we heed, listen to, take note of and act upon that which you, by your Holy Spirit, show to each one of us. We thank you for this time together today, Father. And we praise your wonderful name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.